as usual, a lot is happening in our beautiful country that is Trinidad and Tobago, some of which has quite naturally gotten priority attention from the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And in this regard, I've invited my parliamentary and cabinet colleague, Mr. Martin Gonzalez, Marvin Gonzalez, Member of Parliament and Minister of Public Utilities, and of course, because of the implications for some of which we will discuss, I have invited the head, the lead, the Acting Commissioner of Police, Mr. MacDonald Jacob, to be with us. This morning, a video went viral. I had the opportunity to see it, and it revealed the gutting and dismantling of a booster station owned and operated by the Water and Sewerage Authority of Trinidad and Tobago as it tries to provide an essential service, that is to say, the gathering and distribution of water for the use of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, potable in, in most cases for our use and for industrial purposes to keep our economy going. As a result of its importance, among other things, elements, water finds itself as an essential service within the context of the Industrial Relations Act of Trinidad and Tobago. And it is therefore of great concern to the government that citizens of this country, persons, could so easily go into an important facility like a booster station, strip it of its electrical and powering capacity, rendering it unable to provide its booster service and ensuring that many people will not get the water that is available to them for their use. That links in to an ongoing and for months now issue of the unlawful stealing and removal of copper, which was at the heart of our communications system, telecommunication system. Some of those who were engaged in that went as far as to cut even the fiber cables. No copper, but fiber, which raises an issue about their recklessness and possible more devious intentions. All of these things are a serious threat to our ability to communicate in the national community, electricity, and other telecommunications. And of course, as I explained, our water distribution and supply. And we, the government of Trinidad and Tobago, make no bones about it, see this as a serious national security threat and therefore an issue that falls smack bang in the context of our national security efforts. But I've asked the Minister of Public Utilities to be with us today, so I will invite the Minister of Public Utilities to give an indication at this stage as to the impact of this kind of activity on the communication system for which he has general oversight as Minister. Minister Gonzalez. Thank you very much, Minister Hines, my Cabinet and Parliamentary colleague. Good afternoon to the Commissioner of Police, Mr. MacDonald Jacobs, members of the media, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. As Minister Hines would have outlined in his opening statement, this matter of vandalism affecting the public utility system in Trinidad and Tobago is one that is causing us great concern and unease. Over the last two years, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has expended numerous sums 
to improve the national security as well as the public utility infrastructure in Trinidad and Tobago. Is, it is for that reason the government working with the management and the board of TSTT recently took a decision to restructure TSTT so as to ensure that TSTT is a fit for purpose company so that it can provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with reliable telecommunications services, especially in an environment where telecommunications services is one that is key to our very survival. In this pandemic, it is because of telecommunication services, connectivity was important to allow people to work from home, citizens to work from home. It is for that reason our children were educated via online platform. And that suggests to all of us, and it should suggest to all of us, that telecommunication services is very much on the same power with water and electricity vital for our survival and perhaps a basic human right. Unfortunately, over the last year, TSTT, grappling with its financial circumstances, had to deal with a number of vandalism affecting its ability, impacting its infrastructure to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with reliable telecommunication services. I am advised by TSTT that over the last year, the company suffered 361 fiber breaks across Trinidad and Tobago in addition to 90 acts of vandalism. So far, the company has expended $15 million in restoration works across Trinidad and Tobago. 96% of the jobs have already been completed with about 14 restoration projects ongoing at this point in time. The acts of vandalism affecting TSTT's infrastructure is one of grave concern to the Ministry of Public Utilities and by extension the government of Trinidad and Tobago and is costing the company millions of dollars to ensure that it continues to provide reliable broadband services, voice fixed line services, as well as entertainment for all of its customers. The same problem exists for WASA. Over the last year, WASA and its infrastructure suffered tremendous damage and disruption as a result of illegal activities. A number of WASA wells went out of operation, especially in central and east Trinidad, leaving hundreds of thousands of customers without water, pending the full restoration of its infrastructure. I am advised by WASA that so far for the year, over 120 customers across Trinidad and Tobago, especially in North and Central Trinidad, have been impacted. Their water supply has been impacted as a result of vandalism and destruction to its infrastructure that prevents water from flowing into taps and the homes of citizens. So far, WASA has expended $4 million in restoration work to ensure that the people of Trinidad and Tobago and communities all over Trinidad and Tobago continue to get a reliable and a sustainable water supply. Yesterday, that video that was circulating all over and went viral in Trinidad and Tobago concerning that California booster, the cost and the damage was to the tune of $400,000. And it would take WASA two to three weeks to get the infrastructure back up and running, thereby severely impacting the utility company's ability to provide water to the people of California and Point Lisas and surrounding areas. I am advised that infrastructure in Siparia, Penal, Faizabad, Point Fortin and Environs, Mayaro and Environs, Wellington Gardens, Buster Hall, Tatuga, Phoenix Park, Diamond Vale, St. James, Princess Town, all these communities have been impacted by acts of vandalism on Wasser's infrastructure. You would have seen in recent times 
in Bourne's Road in St. James. Where thieves and disruptors went, cut off cable and copper from distribution lines, leaving hundreds of citizens in Bourne's Road and parts of central Trinidad without a reliable supply of water. This situation obviously is one that must be treated seriously. It is criminal in nature. It is intended to cause widespread national chaos and instability. And therefore, the government of Trinidad and Tobago will deal with this as a matter of national security and will respond accordingly. Thank you very much, colleague. And part of that response is also to take into account that as Minister Gonzalez, on behalf of the government of the Republic and for the benefit of all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago in his attempts to make WASA that important institution which manages this essential service and distributes it in accordance with the Industrial Relations Act. As he seeks to bring greater efficiency and to wipe away any corruption that was quite evident and inefficiencies that were quite evident in the operations of WASA for a long time, there are those in Trinidad and Tobago who prefer to maintain the status quo because they benefit directly and in some cases indirectly from it. The government is not unmindful that in their resistance and their abhorrence of good order and efficiency and no corruption in that state entity and others, there will be pushback. And we in Trinidad and Tobago, truth be told, have had a history in the expression of that kind of pushback to sacrifice you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, by disrupting either the free flow of traffic on the road or disrupting the systems that distribute water and electricity. So we are not unmindful of the great possibility that inside of that which the minister has just explained, and all of the public talk about theft of copper, there might be those who may very well use these opportunities to perpetrate more sinister motives against the state for their own limited, perhaps selfish, perhaps even political purposes. So in terms of the government's response, we first decide that this will be treated as a matter of national security. And we have asked the police, led by Mr. Jacob, Mr. Jacob, Mr. McDonald Jacob, to heighten their focus on these installations. in the protection of the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So I would like now to invite Mr. Jacob, who will tell us what kind of activity the police found themselves engaged in in response to this situation that has been going on for many months now, what the police has been doing in relation to it and in particular the matter that my colleague spoke about in California, the disruption of one of our booster stations. Thank you very much. Commissioner, sorry about that. Yeah. Again, good afternoon to all. Thank you very much, um, Minister, and also Minister Gonzalez. The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is really and truly taken aback from what is happening in relation to the number of reports concerning the stealing of cable, the copper, and also what we look at at the malicious damage that is occurring at these various installations. For the past 
two and a half years, we investigated 192 such reports. In fact, 139 persons were arrested and charged. And out of that, two dealers, scrap yard dealers, one in Trinidad and one in Tobago, was in fact charged. But the acts continue. And that is the reason why we strongly believe that it is beyond the question of just larceny. Last weekend, I visited the crime scene at Cross Crossing in San Fernando at the TSTT location. And what I saw there was beyond theft. I saw that the copper wire was in fact cut out and removed, but also all the fiber optic cables were also cut and just was left on the ground. My officers also report similar incidents at different locations. So it moved from just larceny to malicious damage in the police terms where persons are maliciously damaging these particular installations. The police service last weekend had no alternative but to call out additional officers to work additional hours in the southern and southwestern divisions because of uh, that communication situation that occurred whereby those copper wires and fire optic cable being cut and removed created a significant security risk for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago if they wish to communicate with the police. In fact, we had to implement an emergency plan to deal with the situation as it relates to those two divisions, and additional officers were called out. We have not yet done a course analysis, as Mr. Gonzalez spoke about earlier, that he worked out the actual course. We can also work out the actual course of what it is causing us when we have to investigate and implement our emergency plans. As it relates to the incident in Coover, California at Phoenix Park, that reporters meet us, and the senior superintendent, he has in fact appointed a team of investigators to investigate the matter. When he spoke to me and spoke, and he told me what the investigators saw, they have the strong opinion that definitely it is beyond the question of just larceny. It is definitely, as I said in the police term, malicious damage. We, ha we have not yet gotten the cause of the malicious damage from the authorities, but I know that we will get it soon. But now we are going beyond that. When these installations are affected, it creates a lot of difficulty for the police in policing the various areas. Because when our citizens are out of water, out of communication, again, some persons may choose to use different means by protests, demonstrations, because they are out of water and the police again need to act. We have viewed this situation as definitely a security risk for Trinidad and Tobago, which is affecting the national security network. And we firmly believe at this stage, with the consent of the Minister of National Security, 
we have decided to offer a reward of 100,000 for information that can lead to the arrest and prosecution of the persons who are responsible. We'll be utilizing initially our initial numbers of 555 and 800 tips, and we'll be doing a release with some other numbers that can be utilized in this regard. I wish to reinforce the point that what is happening is no benefit to our citizens in Trinidad and Tobago, and it is posing a security risk. We, the police, will in fact implement additional measures and will be paying attention to all these various installations to ensure that our tranquil living in Trinidad and Tobago is not interrupted. Again, Minister, thank you very much as we look forward to deal with this scourge that is existing in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, Commissioner Jacob. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the police has found that from the evidence available to them that it appears to be a little more than mere larceny. The Malicious Damage Act, since you mentioned it, Commissioner, in Section 21, speaks specifically that particular section about waterworks and wassers facilities. So I do hope that the citizens of this country, in their own interest, because every time you can't get water, you can't, be, you can't communicate. I mean, for days last week, we have been having problem even with our internet communication, they're cutting these fiber cables and just leaving it there. So we would like the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, the end users, who are the ones who will more directly suffer as a result of this horrendous, selfish, sickening, malicious, and probably more kind of behavior, to speak up to law enforcement. We have asked the defense force to heighten patrols around the facilities, communications facilities, and our waterworks as well, to keep watch. And we ask the citizens to reach out and touch that very generous award, reward of 100,000. It could go a long way, but longer still, it would put some of the criminals where they ought to be and it will ensure, with their absence, that your communication and your water service is not troubled. And since I was talking about the Malicious Damage Act, and I did speak earlier about the Industrial Relations Act, we are not unaware that in the middle of all the protestation about what is happening in Wassa, people might want to behave in a certain way. The Industrial Relations Act will be brought to bear in its full force and glory, and then of course at the higher extreme where the threshold is a lot higher and the standard that is required to prove it is even more, there's the Anti-Terrorism Act in Trinidad and Tobago where if it could be shown that that kind of action has political motivations, I am sure the Police Commissioner Jacob will pay close attention to its application where appropriate. But the government only Thursday, sitting in the cabinet, my colleague and I, we would have been dealing with an attempt by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to deal with this problem. And so, the Prime Minister had publicly asked the Attorney General to contemplate and formulate proposals to stem this dangerous activity that has now found itself inside of the scrap metal trade. Because those who are in the scrap metal trade have explained painstakingly, we have an industry here, we have a business here, 
but there are criminals who are causing us stress. And we are prepared to regulate our affairs, and we are prepared to give information to law enforcement so that our industry will remain untouched and the criminals will be found. And we salute that. But in the meantime, the government had to act. So the Prime Minister asked on behalf of his entire government and the Attorney General, in fact, first of all, the Prime Minister put a committee, with the Attorney General, a sub-cabinet committee, the Attorney General, the Minister of Trade and Industry, Paula Gopi School, the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, Mr. Stuart Young, and yours truly as Minister of National Security, and we put our heads together on behalf of the government and for the benefit of the people of this country. And the Attorney General took a note to Cabinet last Thursday, which has been sent to the Finance and General Purposes Subcommittee of the Cabinet for its urgent consideration. And we expect by Monday, as we meet in Finance and General Purposes Committee, we will tidy up any issues that would arise out of these measures to deal with this problem. So let me tell you quickly what these measures are. One, the preparation of the prohibition carriage, coastwise importation and exportation amendment order 2022, pursuant to section 44 of the Customs Act Chapter 7801. Two, the making of the order by, under the hand of the Secretary to Cabinet, in respect of what I have just said. Three, the preparation of an, an, amend, an amendment to the export negative list order made pursuant to the imports and export control regulations of the Trade Ordinance Number 19 of 1958. And finally, for the urgent preparation of draft regulations in relation to the regulation, monitoring, and enforcement of responsible practices within the old metals industry, including the preparation of draft orders under the hand of the Minister of Trade and Industry to permit that the items under ferrous waste and scrapped, scrap be added to the export negative list, which will now require a license from the Minister of Trade and Industry in order for these items to be exported. Quite a mouthful for lawyers, and lawmakers, as we parliamentarians are. In short, this is saying that it will permit the Minister of Trade and Industry to make regulations, to regulate those affairs, and more importantly, to amend the export list to add these metals so that in order to export them, you will have to obtain first a license in the context of that regulation. Effectively, the government is proposing a six-month ban on the exportation of old and scrap iron, including copper, including people gate, including the covers on the drains and manholes around the place, including the barriers along the highway that have been put there to ensure that if a car loses control, it doesn't go over onto the other lane and cause mayhem and murder, uh, sorry, and damage to other users of the road. I can tell you as Minister of National Security, even those involved in energy, in this country, drilling, production of oil and gas, they too have suffered as a result of this madness taking place in our land. So on your behalf, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, we the government, courageous as ever, doing what has to be done at all costs, we will 
The proposal in front of the cabinet now is to ban the exportation for six months, during which time the Minister of Trade and Industry will re make regulations to more effectively manage this industry and the activity that we now complain of. And finally, Sir Jacob didn't say it, but I will. The intelligence agencies of this country have been paying close attention to some of the deliberations that are taking place in public spaces and public offices. And as a consequence, the police, supported by the defense force, supported by such intelligence, are very mindful of some of the plots that are taking place. That incident in California yesterday coincides with plots that the intelligence agencies are paying attention to. So we urge the citizens of this country, whatever your cause, whatever your motivations, however you feel, you don't have to go there. Come down from there. There are always opportunities, whether it is through the courts or otherwise, to resolve your grievances. But if you choose, to resort to disrupting our communications networks and our water distribution networks to suffer the people of Trinidad and Tobago, we are sworn to protect against it. And the police service is even more deeply entrenched as the law enforcement agency, along with the defense force and other arms of national security, to treat with the issues. And again, as I conclude, I ask the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago these things are not happening in the sky. They are happening right here on Jar Earth. So if you see them, call the numbers Mr. Jacob have shared. You could become $100,000 better off tomorrow. And of course, at the same time, you would have made a serious citizen's contribution to the stability and the maintenance of law and order and the good governance and the peace and serenity, as he described it, of this land, our beautiful Trinidad and Tobago. We are now open to any questions you, the members of the media, would have on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago in relation to the matters that we have just raised. I thank you. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I'm with the news day. I'm starting off with you, Minister Hines. You made mention at the end there of a plot that the, um, the intelligence agencies would have uncovered. Um, this plot, is there any political ingredients? I'm unable to say. What I could tell you is that I received a call this morning from someone, a communication, that told me certain things. I am unable to say. Apart from that, um, could you elaborate a bit more on, on these, or this plot? I don't know if it's one or many plots. Um, elaborate just a bit more without going into national security issues. I would hardly know all of them. I'm not there. I don't work in the intelligence industry. But what I do know, criminal activity is taking place. Criminal minds are at work. And therefore, there's always plotting and planning. And the intelligence agencies, their business is to unearth these plots and these plans in the protection of you, Jensen Lavin, and all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Don't forget, you know, you may not have been around or maybe too immature to recall, but I recall on one occasion at the Trinidad Hilton, we had cricketers here, I think, from one visiting team, and we had a serious problem up there in the context of industrial turmoil in this country. And we've seen many other examples of it. So in this context, all things are possible. 
and it is the job of the intelligence agencies who are sworn and paid to get to the bottom of those and share them with the law enforcement platform to protect you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. On that issue of protection, um, the question will be asked, why then didn't the security agencies, rather than allow what happened yesterday, um, prevent it by sharing I think information? That's easy to understand and easy to say. I can tell you, I don't know if Mr. Jacob mentioned it, I am aware, in fact, I think he said it, that within recent times the police have heightened their activity. They have gone to some of these facilities, they do patrols around there, there are some private security elements. But the truth of the matter is the police cannot be everywhere. Any plans? And, 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 and we have now asked the Defense Force, I can tell you, collaboration is taking place um, between all stakeholders so that we can better manage this situation. Now, I know you said there will be increased um, patrols. There have been, out. and they have there will been. continue to be, from what I have been advised by the commissioner, who you can direct your questions to. He's yeah. better able to answer those than I. Well, this question is whether or not um, the government will be looking at private security for these compounds, because TTPS is already spread thin. Uh, is the government considering that? I don't know if there's anything to consider per se, because there are private security entities operating across Trinidad and Tobago as we speak, but this activity is taking place. So the police, on behalf of all of us, have heightened the activity in order to deal with this, and they would best know how. Now, you mentioned the banning of the, the industry for six months. The um, exportation, exportation of those metals. When will that um, come into effect? Well, the matter, as I indicated a moment ago, is before the cabinet. And when the cabinet settles on it, it is only then I'd be able to answer your question. But I only wanted you and the people of Trinidad and Tobago to know that the matter is so grave, so serious, so urgent. The Prime Minister instructed the Attorney General, and to his credit, the Attorney General promptly drafted this uh, cabinet note. It is now before us. Again, we don't do things on the hoof. Um, it is considered by another subcommittee of the cabinet called FNGP. We will go through it a lot more thoroughly, and I'm confident that by Monday, um, FNGP would um, indicate to the cabinet for cabinet's consideration shortly um, what its recommendations are. And if accepted by the cabinet, it is then that the order that it seeks to put in place will be put in place. And when did the subcommittee... Um, meet with the Scrap Iron Dealers Association to discuss this? We met with them, I think, about two weeks ago, the exact date. So much is happening, uh, Mr. Levi. I can't tell you the exact date, but I can tell you within the last, like, about two weeks ago, we met and we listened to what they had to say, the subcommittee of which I spoke, and we um, took on board their considerations, and now the cabinet is considering this matter. That's after reading a lot about it in your papers too, and after hearing a lot of people complain about losing the gate and losing everything, and videos all over the place, like the one of yesterday. So the government is a listening government. We Speak hear, we look, we listen, we see, we learn, and we act. Speaking of listening and, and, and learning, um, <clears throat> how many people will be affected when this and I'm saying when this comes into effect. I'm unable to say, but I did indicate to you there is a scrap iron industry, and the leader of that scrap, what's his name? Alan Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson has been screaming from the top of his lungs about how this nasty activity has been affecting his bona fide metal trading activity. We have heard what he had to say. We understand. We admire what he had to say. And we've taken it into account, but the government has to act. And we are acting in the way that has been proposed. Once the cabinet agrees, we do so on behalf of all of the people of this land. Um, Commissioner, you said there were 192 reports in the last two and a half years with oh, 139 people being arrested, two of them being scrap iron dealers. Um, given what the, the ministers have been saying, it seems as though there is some involvement with state officers. Um, of this 139 people charged, how many were TSTT, WASA, TNTEC, government workers? 
I, I don't have that information at hand at this time, whether or not any state um, workers were charged. What I can say, that in some of the incidents, persons definitely had a knowledge in how these installations were secured and what is needed in order that they can go about carrying out their activities. I have a few more questions, but I won't be selfish, so I'll pass the mic on and wait for you to come back. I was about to say, it seems as though you are developing, <laughs> but um, I admire that, Lucy. You're very generous. I admire that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Could you help Good afternoon. Me Ayana me, Carter from TTT News. I just wanted to find out about the, well, the Scrap Iron Dealers Association has been calling for regularization and assistance from the government in that respect. Will this be fast-tracked now that um, systems are being put in place? Please forgive me, I lost a couple of words of your question. <laughs> Will the regularization that the scrap iron dealers have been asking government for assistance for, will this process be considered and fast-tracked now as part of dealing with this situation? Yes, well, I did indicate that we are going, we are asking for an outright ban for six months, during which time regulations would be done by the Ministry of Trade and Industry, under whose purview that kind of activity falls. And those regulations and their development will take into account the submissions of the Mr. Ferguson and his team. Because we do recognize there's a legitimate industry. Minister Gonzalez, um, Wasa Police, what role will they play in, in this heightened security? So, Wasa has a contingent of internal um, estate police, and they have been deployed on some of Wasa's premises across Trinidad and Tobago. But in addition to that, WASA also employs private security arrangements to secure some of its compound. So at this point in time, the, the police, WASA estate police, will continue to do its work. They've been asked to monitor some key plants and key installations across Trinidad and Tobago that are vulnerable, and they're doing their part. And where it is possible to utilize the private security arrangements that is also being utilized. But I can also tell you that a lot of focus is being placed upon the utilization of technology, remote camera monitoring systems on all of WASA's infrastructure. And as I speak, very soon I expect quite a large percentage of WASA's infrastructure where we can place remote monitoring systems that can assist the internal security arrangements as well as the private security arrangements to monitor some of WASA's key installations. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned technology. There was a question that I, I jotted down. Um, and, and before you do, permit me to say, in extension to what my colleague has said, that it is because we understand how serious and how urgent this is, we have deployed the entire panel P of the law enforcement platform, including with the support of the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force across Trinidad and Tobago, and as I said earlier, supported by our intelligence gathering agencies. All are now deployed, working together. And in addition to that, Mr. Jacobs' generous offer of $100,000 is to bring the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly the right-minded and decent citizens who are to be affected by all of this, to bring them into the theater and to ask them to share what they see and what they hear and what they know in this effort. So really, all of Trinidad and Tobago should be involved in this effort to protect our assets and our stability as a nation. 
going back to the question of um, technology, will going forward after this ban is, is implemented, um, will the ministry, Mr. Minister Gonzalez, seek to put identifying marks on all of the, the, the nation's um, copper and, and all the other items that are being stolen? These, these um, electronic dots, I think they, they call them. Is, is that a consideration? It will be a consideration. As a matter of fact, the review of security arrangements on assets, that is something that is continuous. TSTT is aware of what it has to do in order to protect evidence, to assist the police when persons are prosecuted to identify evidence, etc. So I can tell you that that is something that is being examined closely so as to ensure that when persons are prosecuted, when persons are arrested, that the utility companies, TSTT and WASA, would be able to identify their assets in order to allow the police to effectively prosecute persons who are charged and who are arrested for these crimes. My final question to you. Um, you mentioned 15 million plus 4 million spent to repair some of these um, mm -hmm. damaged states. Yeah, 15 in one case and then four in another. And I could also oh. tell you, in addition to that, I've been now advised by TN Tech that they suffered $3 million in damage to their infrastructure. For example, the cutting down of poles at Pfizer Bar, the cutting down of poles at Pinal, the theft of cable at the DB, the DB substation, the cable theft at St. Mary's substation, and the cable theft at Pinto Road substation. All of the losses and the damage costing the Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission to the tune of $3 million in damage to its infrastructure. My math, I believe, is correct. That's $22 million within this year alone. That's right. Um, we have been complaining a lack of resources since for a while now. Um, how will this affect the running of these state agencies to now have to find an additional $22 million that was not budgeted for to repair these items? Um, well, unfortunately, that kind of expenditure should have been utilized to improve services in water, electricity, and telecommunication services. It is unfortunate that the utility companies now have to expend millions of dollars to restore service to customers. Monies that could have been utilized to improve and to expand services to unserved and unserved communities. It is unfortunate, but the utility companies are unfortunately placed in a position where large sums of monies now have to be utilized to resource, restore services as a result of these criminal acts by a very small sect of the society who continues to be bent on creating havoc and creating instability in the society. Um, what projects would have to be sacrificed in order to facilitate these repairs? Well, thankfully, the government is committed to funding WASA the Trinidad and Tobago Telecom, um, the Electricity um, Commission um, in its development program to expand the water infrastructure as well as the electricity infrastructure. So I can tell you that despite these unfortunate incidents, it will not disrupt the government's plan for the Water and Sewage Authority to expand and improve water infrastructure as well as to expand and improve um, the telecommunications, as well as the electricity sector in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Minister, Minister yes. Hines, here yeah, two final questions from me for you. Um, firstly, you have been a minister for well over two decades. You know the psyche of the, the population. I can foresee people saying, you are doing this so that the, your financiers and the one percenters could take over the industry, the scrap iron industry. Um, so taking front, how would you respond to that even now? All things are possible to be said in this country. If you ask three Trinidadians the opinion, you will get five. All things are possible. 
and the media will publish all of those wonderful things. Uh, first of all, I don't enjoy using the term 1%, particularly coming out of emancipation celebrations, recognizing that all of us in Trinidad and Tobago, apart from the indigenous and first people, so-called, have come here under one set of circumstances or the other. All of us have come here in one way and for one reason or at one time or the other. I personally abhor the, the use of the term 1%. It really is a horrible kind of a construct. I don't care if it was a own goal or otherwise. I don't like it and I don't use it. I respect all of us as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to start with. So if anybody approach me saying that, I'll get angry, provoked, one time and I might cut the conversation. I feel I better cut it now. No, answer no. What was the question? How would you respond to people saying that your financiers and those in I, the I will ignore I will ignore them and that as folly and focus on the matters raised by my colleague, focus on the responses raised by the Commission of Police, and we will get on with the business of governing Trinidad and Tobago and setting it right for the benefit of all of you in Trinidad and Tobago. I thank you very much. I had one more thing. You do? Yes. Okay. I said two. I, um, you mentioned repeatedly that this is now a national security issue. We see it as such. Yes. Yes. How, how did you view it prior to um, yesterday? Well, quite frankly, I always saw it as such, me personally. But I am sure now that most people in the national community will, because water is essential to life and for life, Anything that threatens that, particularly, not drought, mm -hmm. not climate change, but man, Trinidadians, selfish criminals, for whatever reason, disrupting and, de and, and damaging our booster stations, that's a very serious business as far as we are concerned. And I'm sure most people in Trinidad and Tobago would think that. In addition to that, I told you, under the Industrial Relations Act, it is given a pride of place as an essential service and is seen in a particular way. And the Commissioner explained to you today that based on the evidence as unearthed by the police, they have seen evidence of pure malice. And that malice could be motivated by all kinds of reasons. I wouldn't speculate. All I did was to demonstrate what the law says from the Industrial Relations Act to the Malicious Damages Act to the Anti-Terrorism Act, the full panel P, the full range of the laws of Trinidad and Tobago and more that will be brought to bear when the evidence found by the police matches any one of them. And that being your final question, I would like to thank you profusely and wish you, gentlemen of the media and ladies, Godspeed. And I would like you to use the facilities available to you as the media, the fourth estate in this constitutional arrangement, to encourage the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to do right unto Trinidad and Tobago. And in this particular case, Work hard towards the 100,000 that has been generously offered and share information. We want to find those who did that in California yesterday. Good luck, God bless, and we thank you. This is TTT. Live for local. The views expressed in this program are not necessarily the views of TTT Limited. Please be 